Good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. Before we get started this morning, this church is founded on prayer for share. And uh, I want to start this morning a prayer for a dear member of our congregation, Alan, as well as for Mark and Lori. Almighty and merciful God, you are the only source of health and healing. You alone can bring calmness and peace. Grant to our brother Harold an awareness of your presence and a strong confidence in you. In his pain, weariness, anxiety, surround him with your care. Protect him by your loving might and grant to him once again the gifts of health and strength and peace. Through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, good morning. Good morning. Um, I'm not sure where our warm weather went. It kind of ran away from us, but that's okay. We got the heat on in here <laughs> again. It's kind of. I really like my nest, our the nest thermostat we have at home, because right now it's set that if it goes below a certain temperature, the heat comes on. If it goes above a certain temperature, the heat, uh, air comes on. I don't have to play. I just set it for good. And then if I need to, I just whip up my phone and adjust it. <laughs> but if you are watching online, welcome as well. Uh, we'd love to know that you're here. Please uh, either <coughs> like the video or even better, say hi so we know that you're here. Coming up this week, we have our men's, or our men's, I'm jumping way ahead of myself. We have our Bible study and prayer time at seven o'clock. We invite you to join us for that. Following that, the, in two weeks, uh, we will be having our men's breakfast right here at uh, 9 a.m. So the sanctuary becomes a restaurant. And then right after that, we're going to change it up and turn it back into a movie theater. And we are showing the movie uh, The Shack. Now, uh, this movie is based on a New York Times bestselling novel. I want to stress that novel. This is fiction. The Shack takes us on a father's uplifting spiritual journey, but we want everyone to know that we do recognize the controversial nature of this movie, and that by hosting this event, we are not endorsing the views expressed in this work of fiction. Did I say fiction? Fiction. I can't, we can't stress that enough, but we see it as an opportunity to open discussion into spiritual matters. And I've had a couple of conversations outside of our church about this. And someone brought to my attention that, hey, uh, we've read the book, we haven't seen the movie, but we've read reviews and it, there's, and it's like, I know, we know this is a work of fiction. And I, I let them know that we did put this that final statement on our website as well as on all of our social media. We can't stress it enough. But if we can take something and we can turn it into a spiritual discussion that we can help someone walk from where they're at, which is likely believing in things like this or other things of that nature, and walk them to a spiritual awakening and an understanding of who Jesus Christ is, really is and who God really is, then it will have accomplished uh, what we set out for it to do. Now, if you'd like to check out the trailer for that, go out to our website. Um, you can click on the Grace Street, uh, uh, Grace Street Cinema link at the top right, but there's also a pop-up that's going to come up on the screen as well, and you can click there and it'll take you right there. You can read a little bit more about what the movie is about, see that disclaimer on there and watch that video. Diane and I have seen the, uh, the movie. It is a very good movie, a very good fictional movie. <laughs> Let me just go back right there. But, um, so we're, we're looking forward to that. And to take that one step further, we have chosen to do a five week sermon series following the movie. That sermon series will take us through and have those take us from those spiritual conversations to biblical truth. 
So uh, now that I've covered that extensively, we'll move on. The following Saturday, we will be having our May Orange Track Racing uh, Series races. Uh, registration at 9.30 with racing starting and approximately 10 o'clock. More information at orangetrackracing.org. And those of you that are watching online, also look for the link to this morning's worship music uh, so that you can worship once the, uh, the live stream has ended. Well, Father God, we come before you right now. We come before you with somewhat heavy hearts as we think about Harold. Uh, he's just been on top of my mind ever since Mark let me know that he had had a stroke. And we, we just ask for peace and comfort for not only for Harold, but for the family, as this is, it's difficult to watch a family member go through something like this and not have answers. But Father, you are the ultimate physician. You are already there. And you are the only one in which we can find peace and comfort. Father, as we prepare to hear this morning's message, let us resonate with what you have given me and that we hear this message and that we are able to take it out and use it in our daily lives father we want every message and everything that we teach here to be biblical and we also want it to be relevant relevant to our lives that we can use it and not just have it be uh, some kind of a lecture where people hear it and forget it we want it to become part of the very fabric of our lives, Father, in Jesus' name, amen. So as I think about the very fabric of our lives, that brings us to our call to worship this morning. This comes from Jeremiah 1, verses 4 and 5, from the New International Version, where it says, The Lord gave me this message. And this, honestly, I mean, we're reading out of Jeremiah, and we're talking about the message that Jeremiah received, but the Lord gives us these messages. And before I formed you, the Lord said, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Now that last part, I appointed you as a prophet to the nations, that is specific to Jeremiah. The rest of it is for us as well. Jeremiah learned three very important truths about God in this first message that he received. First one is God's knowledge of everything, including us. He knows all. Second thing is God's ability to choose specific people for specific <coughs> things long before we are born. And then the third thing, God is willing to expand his authority to his people to do what he calls them to do. God set Jeremiah apart to perform a specific task. That was the task of being a prophet, to going out, and as you see the, the last part of this, to the nations. Not just Judah, not just Israel, but to the world. And they the incredible thing is this, Jeremiah left Judah three times. But his writings have been read around the world ever since. Now Mark and I ask this question constantly. Life ends eternity where? Because it is important. At the beginning, it is also important. Life begins. Because in order for life to end, there has to be a beginning. So let's talk about that. Life begins. When does life begin? Well, in scripture, Jeremiah, but let's go back to verse 5, this time from the New Living Translation. It says, I knew you before I formed you in your mother's womb. Before you were born, I set you apart and appointed you as my prophet to the nations. God knew Jeremiah, and God knows us. Not after we were born, but long. 
long before. Long before we were, as the old saying goes, a, a twinkle in our mother's eye. Long before we were conceived. He knew about each and every one of us. He thought about each and every one of us. And he planned for each and every single one of us. There was nothing left unplanned for. What does that tell you? It's a rhetorical question nobody needs to answer. I'll answer it. <laughs> it means that we are valuable and that God has a purpose for each of us. Today we started by focusing on the beginning. And we've talked a lot about what happens at the end. Now we've talked a little bit about what happens in the, the beginning, but what happens in the dash? So this morning we're going to talk about living in the dash. Now when I put this graphic up on, online, I didn't put the dash because I figured it would be go living in the minus. <laughs> I actually put the word living in the dash out there. And when you think about that dash, think about all the things that are going on. For some of you, there has been more going on in the last 48 hours than you care to have happen. But over the last several weeks, so much has happened just in my life. I can't speak for you. I don't know everything that happens, but in addition to my dad passing away, I've had several friends who have lost family members just in the last few weeks. High school friend TJ, he lost his brother Tyler. Then a uh, high school classmate of Diane's, and he actually was the CNA uh, where Diane's grandmother was at. His father passed away. So when I say Terry lost his dad, I'm not talking about me, I'm talking about uh, someone else. And then I just found out that uh, a friend from another friend from high school just lost her father. When stuff happens like this in our lives, we are in shock. We grieve, and then this truth hits. And I've said this to Diane the other day. We had the met. We had the service for Dad on on Saturday a week ago, and then all of a sudden, life just kept moving forward. Life didn't stop. Now eventually we will all have two dates showing on a gravestone or a marker, and some gravestones show differently than others, but the one that sticks out to me has a dash between the dates. I found a blank one, so I went ahead and chiseled on it virtually. And <laughs> beloved husband and father, 1946 to 2023, but there's that dash in the middle. We know what the beginning number is. That's the birth year. We know what the ending number is. That's the year of passing. But what happened in those 76 years living in the dash? Now, mine, I know at some point, is going to say 1966 and have a dash and say 20 whatever. Because I, I'm smart enough to know that I'm not going to get to 21 in a number. <laughs> I mean, I think it's pretty cool that uh, my great-grandmother lived in two centuries. She was born in the early 1880, or late 1880s, 1889, and she lived in, to 1984. As a kid, that was so cool. She lived in two whole centuries. Yeah, about 10, 15 years ago, I came to the realization that so die. <laughs> but here's the thing. In that dash, life has purpose. <coughs> we have a purpose in life. Now, uh, we have our plans, and God has his plans. And then I get on social media this morning, and Benjamin Watson, who is an incredible athlete, he's retired now, but he put up this graphic on his social media this morning. My plan, God's plan. Sometimes God doesn't do things the way we think he should. 
But God has a perfect plan for our life. He has a perfect purpose for our life. So I go back to life has purpose. We need to trust in God. For Jeremiah, that purpose was as God's prophet to the nations. And regardless of what you or I are called to do, we should always do it for the glory of God. And not only that, but we need to accept it and we need to do it with diligence. If you are not sure what that purpose is yet, because people in all walks of life from beginning to end still sometimes wonder what that is, we can do something. We can follow the mission that all believers have, and that is to love, honor, obey, and serve God. It may not be as a prophet, may not be as a teacher or a pastor or, or whatever, but we can always love, honor, obey, and serve. And as we go through life, we're going to have so many experiences. Each of us, each of those experiences teach us lessons, good and bad whether we want to learn from them or not. I met with a, a former manager of mine when I was working in the restaurant industry, and I, I, she was a district manager at the time, and she agreed to meet with me, and I said, what am I supposed to do? My, my immediate manager, he just doesn't do, and he's not doing his job, he's not doing, and you know what her advice was? It wasn't about, the lesson wasn't about what he is doing, it was about what he is not doing. Don't do what he does, do what he's not doing. And you'll be a better manager. And it's, see, it's through those experiences that God is able then to use us. Now, it might be in the moment of the experience that you're going through that you learn the lesson, or it could be decades later. You look back on it, that those 2020 vision, because take the glass off, you have 2020 vision. You can see everything and you understand what was going on. And it might be other experiences that stack up on top of that original one that then allow you to fully see what God was teaching. And all these things, they have impacts on us at some point in our lives, and God will use them to bring glory to Himself. Now, Few of us remember things from the first couple of years of life, right? Let alone things that will happen later or how they will affect us later. But I told you guys here within the last couple of weeks that I fell into a pool once. How did that affect my life? Did I become scared of the water? Mm, nope. I became a lifeguard and a boating instructor. <laughs> Another experience that I have is when I was three, I remember on being on the farm with my maternal grandmother, Grandma Olson, and on the, the lane, the rock lane, there were these little tiny, and I couldn't find one. I know I have one in a drawer, but I couldn't find one. There were these little tiny pebbles on their beige. And I remember that. But here's the thing. She passed right after my third birthday. So over the years, Seeing Grammy Ureta's face is hard to do. Remembering those times is hard to do, but as I walk along the, a gravel road and I see one of those, instantly her face shows up in my mind and I remember those things. I also remember helping on the farm. What did that teach me? Well, at the time I thought it was fun because you know, you're eight, nine, 10 years old, shoveling corn with a grain shovel into the out of the corn bin and these are on the cob and you're putting them onto a conveyor to go through a sheller that's a neat experience to remember but what did it teach me it taught me how to work it gave me a work ethic and then there was a time that i turned into the driveway when we lived out in the country i hit a little pothole and i went through the bars of a bicycle uh, this, is the this is the first and only time that I flew like Superman. <laughs> Although I didn't get up like him, I had a gash on my knee that was about this long. And I found out stitches don't always have to happen. If your mom's got some band-aids and she pushes everything together after washing it up, she'll heal it right up. 
but I learned in that moment and I'm still learning. I'm not as invincible as I thought I was and I'm finding out more and more that I'm less and less invincible, especially as I get older and things creak a little bit more. But those are lessons that we can learn from our life experiences. Now, other memories get more vivid from there because you get older. I remember getting hit by a car walking home from a scout meeting. I remember being so embarrassed by it. I didn't get hurt. Not a scrape, not a, didn't tear up my pants when I rolled back up down onto the ground. I didn't tell mom and dad for 20 years, but that's another thing. I remember working at scout camp. I remember when our daughters were born. I remember when our grandkids were born. I remember my first date with Diane. And we still celebrate that. And I can tell you the month and the day and the year. 82998. This year will be 25 years. Sorry. Oh, no, I'm not. I'm not sorry at all. But God had a purpose through each and every one of those things, a part of his purpose in bringing me or putting Diane in my life was to bring me back to the Lord. Some of you may have had an experience similar to that where you meet someone who draws you back to the Lord. Certainly, uh, that's going back to Jeremiah, we're not all set apart to be a prophet, but we are all set apart for something. And what we need to be keenly aware of is that life is short. Some say too short. Three instances in my life popped up. I remember Shannon, my best friend. On October 23rd, 1977, four members of the Clarion family died in a plane crash near Blair, Nebraska. Lost were Rodney Muller, who was only 40. He was the owner of the funeral home there in town. His wife, Bonnie, was 41. His daughter Tracy was 16 and his son Shannon was 12. They died because of fog. The plane crashed. I did get to know Kim, the other daughter, after the fact. She chose, she had something that she needed to do and that's why she didn't go with the family. Then I'm transported to July 13th, 2012, which is the date that officials believe that Elizabeth Collins and Larry Cook Morrissey had their lives taken from them, having last been seen around Myers Lake. They were not found until December 12th, or December 5th of that same year. And then just most recently, we had six souls lose their lives in a shooting. Three nine-year-olds, Haley Scruggs, Evelyn Dykhouse, and William Kinney, along with three adults, who when I would have looked at their ages, 20 years ago, I said, they were old. <laughs> yeah, their ages are, I'm within five years of, of their ages. They were 60 and 61. And this was just less than a month ago. Some of us race through life living like there's no tomorrow. We do things that we probably shouldn't do and, and we don't worry about things, but some of us worry all the way through it. Because, oh, what's tomorrow going to bring? Oh, what's this going to be? I've been there, done that. I'm not, not guilty of that. Some try to reverse it. We want to reverse the aging process because, you know, we want to look good. I was thrilled to see that uh, one of uh, the actors that I grew up watching as a kid, uh, first as the flying nun and then as the the girl in the Trans Am and smoking the bandit, Sally Field chose not to do any of that. So she has graced a, uh, mm -hmm. gracefully aged. She didn't worry about the aging. I see these commercials for aging creams, and, mm -hmm. and we know people are having plastic surgery. It's like, yeah, just put this stuff like this and it'll make your skin so smooth and like a baby. And it's like, mm, I don't need that. Here's what the psalmist writes. Psalm 102, three says this, for my days disappear like smoke and my bones burn like red hot coals. Psalm 90 verses 10 and 12 
70 years are given to us. Some even might live to 80, but even the best years are filled with pain and trouble. Soon they disappear and we fly away. And then in verse 12, it says, teach us to realize the brevity of life so that we may grow in wisdom. We, we have to, we need to, we must change our mindset. We can't just say, oh, I'll get to it tomorrow. We've gotten very good at, at making lists in our house, whether it's uh, on a calendar or on our electronic Google calendar or just a handwritten note. And the one thing that I, one of the few things that I don't like to do is writing notes, thank you notes. Well, after a celebration of life, there's quite a few. Diane made a list. That was part of the reason God gave me Diane. She wrote a list, and I said, put it on the list, and then we have to do it. We can't say we'll do it. So on Wednesday, she put it on the list. Saturday came, we had it planned out, and we knocked every single one of them out. My hand was a little cramped. But we got through it. <coughs> Tomorrow is not promised. We don't know what's going to come. When dad laid down on his bed that he got from hospice, he was concerned about doing it himself so he could get up and out of it himself. He got into it, but he never got out. He didn't know what the next day would bring. We need to, instead of worrying about what tomorrow is or putting things up to tomorrow, we need to seek out God's plan for our lives. And here's the thing, you'll, and you all probably know this just as well as I do, and if you're, if you're watching online or you're younger, here's a, here's a little bit of wisdom for you. Life goes faster, or at least it seems like it the older that you get. And the faster that time goes, the faster things change. At the moment, we're going through oh, my dad's stuff. It's all over the house. You can't go anywhere without having a memory go. And as we go through those things, so many thoughts come to mind, wondering, why did he have this or that? Or why on earth did he need six pairs of reading glasses? He, he actually had more, he, he put things, this shirt would not work for him, no pocket. He had a pen, a pencil, a comb, and his readers all in there. And usually one of those little spiral, tiny notepads. Because, you know, if he, he had to pop it in his mind, he'd just write it himself a note. We've also found things from the past, things that make us wonder what he was thinking and what he was going through at that stage of his life. I remember mom making coffee in the morning and she would reuse the grounds from the previous pot. And she might do that for a few days. Why? I didn't know as a kid, but we were strapped for money. It was, during the, it was at the beginning of the farm crisis. My dad's job was in the agricultural industry we didn't know if he'd have a job from day to day. I didn't have a clue. They kept that from us. We had this great life as kids. They took that all on themselves. And now as I get brought to the present knowing all of this, and although the circumstances that we might be in, that I might be in, may be different, we learn lessons from them, watching how they went through life. Solomon's words, though, from Ecclesiastes immediately came to my mind as I'm going through all this and, and preparing the sermon. And from Ecclesiastes 1-2, it says, Everything is meaningless, says the teacher. Completely meaningless. The fact of the matter is we are born, we live, no matter what path we choose, and we die to this life. 
And so if we just look at that with no context, this verse sounds hopeless. And it makes this most, the wisest person to ever live seem like a bad teacher. Solomon, though, wanted the people to understand that the things of this life will not last. That's what he was after. Accomplishments. You know, once Nobody's going to care about that diploma once you're gone. Or that, uh, that degree. The money or possessions, they all disappear. <coughs> the only thing that truly matters that brings real satisfaction is God. God is why life has meaning. People struggle to find the meaning of life. And we often start with goals. And you hear this at work. What do you want to be doing in 5, 10, 20 years? Here's the thing. What if God changes your plans? And as I wrote this down, I wrote this as this. I started off going to school for international business. I had this thing all planned out, right? Here's the problem. I wasn't... God wasn't changing my plans. I was actually trying to change his call on my life. He had called me to a path of ministry years before I decided to do this. So often we get where we are going and we discover there's nothing there. The grass is not always greener on the other side. We come up with empty goals and, and nothing fills that void. It's more than planning for the future. It's about, it's good to have goals, but we cannot leave God out of them. He has to be a part of them. We have to get our wisdom that comes from God. James warns us about not seeking God's will and being overly self-confident about the future. If we turn to James chapter 4, we're going to go through verses 13 through 17 here real quick. The first part of this says, Look here, you who say, Today or tomorrow we are going to a certain town and we'll stay there a year. We will do business there and make a profit. How do you know what your life will be like tomorrow? James tells us that we need to include God since the future is in his hands. Again, life is short. Even if we live to what many would call a ripe old age, life is still short. There's never enough time. There wasn't enough time to do this. There wasn't enough time to do that. It could be family. It could be work. It could be play. Whatever that is. Life can be. Let me reword this. I put life can be. Life is disappointing without God. Amen. James continues and says, Your life is like the morning fog. It's here for a little while, then it's gone. What you ought to say is, If the Lord wants us to, we will live and do this or that. See, all future planning needs to be in God's hands. And he finishes this in 16 and 17 saying, Otherwise, you are boasting about your own plans, and all such boasting is evil. Remember, it is sin to know what you ought to do and then not do it. That's a sin of omission. Sin isn't just doing wrong, it's also not doing what is right. I'm not the one that spread that gossip. But then the question is, what did you do to stop it? We need to seek God in all that we do. There will be good and bad times. And I used to have a an AOL page. Just how fun it dates me. Most people while I'm watching may not even know what that is. I, I I put I had a tagline on my AOL website that said, if it were not for the bad times, I wouldn't know the good ones. Living for God is what we are meant to do. Everything else is about preparing for eternity. Let's look at Matthew 16, 24 and 28. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If any of you wants to be my follower, you must turn from your selfish ways, take up your cross and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul? Is anything worth more than your soul? 
For the Son of Man will come with his angels in the glory of his Father and will judge all people according to their deeds. And I tell you the truth. Some standing here right now will not die before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Jesus Jesus' disciples certainly knew what this meant. Condemned criminals would be beaten and then forced to carry their cross through the streets to where they would be executed by crucifixion. They understood that to follow Jesus was a true commitment. They understood the risk of death was all too real, too real and there was no turning back. We are very fortunate that this is not our reality. But regardless of that being our reality or not, discipleship takes real commitment. It requires it. That means committing our entire existence to God. If we try to protect ourselves from what God has asked us to go through, like I did when I decided I wanted to go into international business, we start to die. And I don't mean a physical death. I'm talking emotionally. And spiritually and it was in that time when I was trying to do what I want to do writing over God's plans for my life that I started to wander away I ended up in my spiritual desert it leaves a hole in our lives that we then try to fill with anything and everything and it becomes this vicious circle that leads us down a very very dangerous path when we have walked away from Jesus, we are putting ourselves in the same boat as those who do not know him. Many think that it's you live, you die in a story. When in reality, how we live our lives here and now determines our eternity. You have two choices. Not multiple choices. Well, it is because it's two. But there's not anything beyond those two choices. It's either eternity with God or eternity apart from God. That's why Pastor Mark and I ask this question so much. Life ends, eternity where? When our earthly life ends, it will not matter where you ended up on that social ladder. It will not matter what your job was. It will not matter how much wealth you accumulated, how good you are or were in this case, none of it matters if you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Jesus has been given all authority to judge the earth, and when he returns, all Christians and non-Christians will face judgment. The difference is God is going to deliver the righteous and only condemn the wicked. We have to be all in. We have to be front and center. That's where we want to be for everything else. We want that recognition at work, or we want to be the best of whatever it is. Why aren't we all in front and center for God? Yes, life is short. How are you living it? We need to live like there is no tomorrow here. We need to live like tomorrow we are entering into eternity. Our life needs to have been about preparing for our eternal destination. Life ends. Eternity where? What I want for each of you is that when that life ends, you hear, well done, good and faithful servant. I'm going to finish with my grandma's favorite poem by Linda Ellis, and it's called The Dash. I read of a man who stood to speak at the funeral of a friend. He referred to the dates on her tombstone from the beginning to the end. He noted that the first came the date of her birth and spoke of the following date with tears, but he said what mattered most of all was the dash between those years. For that dash represents all the time that she spent alive on earth. And now only those who loved her know what that little line is worth. For it matters not how much we own, the cars, the house, the cash. 
What matters is how we live and love and how we spend our dash. So think about this long and hard. Are the things you'd like to change? For you never know how much time is left that can still be rearranged. If we could just slow down enough to consider what's true and real and always try to understand the way other people feel. And be less quick to anger and show appreciation more and love the people in our lives like we've never loved before. If we treat each other with respect and more often wear a smile, remember, remembering that this special dash might only last a little while. So when your eulogy is being read, with your life's actions to rehash, would you be proud of the things they say about how you spent your dash? Father, as we prepare for a time of communion, Father, coming before you and communing with you, remembering what Jesus did for us on the cross, we remember what he did in the dash in his life. We remember the lessons that we learned through the scriptures from the apostles and the other writers. Even those who were secular historians recognize your son. Let us recognize that Jesus is our Lord and Savior and that everything that we do in that dash, Father, that we do it for your glory, for doing what you have called us to do, even if that is to love and care for others and bring glory to you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. It was on the night that Jesus was betrayed that he took the bread and breaking it, he looked at his disciples and he said, this is my body broken for you. Take and eat. And then later in the meal when he took the cup, he filled it, telling him that this is the blood of the new covenant. His blood shed for our sins, making us righteous. Scripture reminds us that as often as we eat of this bread and drink of this cup, we are to do so until Jesus' return. I look forward to that time. The body of Christ broken for you. Take. The blood of Christ shed for you. Take. and our strength and our food, we give you thanks for sustaining us with the body and blood of your Son. By your Holy Spirit, Father, enliven us to be his body in the world, and that more and more we will give you praise and serve you here on this earth and all of the many people that come into our circle of influence. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior. We thank you for Harold's life. We lift him up to you, Jesus. Just comfort him at this time. Take the pain away, Lord God. You are God, and you are walking with him right now. Help him to be strong and courageous and boldly understand who he is with, Lord Jesus, and just comfort
comfort him in this trial. Lord God, don't let him suffer so badly. For you are God, and, and we just love, we love Harold, Lord Jesus. And we love Lori and Mark. Just comfort their hearts and their minds. And know that, you know, Harold has lived such a glorious life for you, Jesus. And we just thank you for him at this time. And we just put him in your care, Jesus. For you are God, the protector, God, the father, and God, the healer of all things. So just comfort them as they go through this trial today and each and every day. Psalm 62, 5 and 8. Find rest, O my soul, in God alone. My hope comes from him. He alone is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I will not be shaken. My salvation and my honor depend on God. He is my mighty rock, my refuge. Trust in him at all times, O people. Pour out your hearts to him, for God is our refuge. Father God, I lift up Monica Burkhart. She's had a um, gastro procedure on Tuesday and is waiting for results. Lord, I just put her in your hands, Lord Jesus, and I pray for good results for her, Lord Jesus. Do not let it be cancer or anything terrible that they cannot repair. Um, through just medicine or um, something simple, Lord Jesus. Be with her and comfort her in this trial that she is facing. Thank you, Father God. We ask for continued prayers for Atlas' son, Demetrius, all my grandsons and granddaughter. And we also ask for prayer for Monica's son, Matt. And we praise you, Father God, for these young men and women. Guide them, Lord Jesus, through each and every day. Put Christian people in their paths. Lead them not into temptation, but deliver them from the evil one. Do not let them be shaken. Bring them into a right relationship with you, O God. Hold on to them and never let them go. Thank you, Jesus. We pray for all those that have been devastated by many tornadoes, flooding, and much snow in the last several weeks. Lord, I feel like you are wanting people to see you to repent, and to pray, to look for you for all things. Please open the eyes of people. Help them to know you are Jehovah Rapha, the God who heals and restores all who come to you. You will provide the help through the storms. For you are the God and Father. You are God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Help our nation to wake up and know who you are. For Ephesians 2.8 say, For it is by grace you have been saved, through faith, and this not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. Help those who are searching for you, either here or online, to accept this free gift of love and amazing grace that you gave up everything to give to us. Thank you, Jesus, in your mighty and precious name. We pray these things. Comfort Mark and Lori and Harold as they go through this day, Lord Jesus. We love them and we just thank you for them. In Jesus' holy name, amen. amen. As we work our way, knowing between that first day and the second day, as we live in the dash, I'm reminded of two things. One comes from Ephesians 6, and Paul writes, Finally be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. And I send you out with this blessing, the same blessing that the Lord gave to Moses for Aaron and his, and his sons to give to the Israelites and ultimately to us. Uh, may the Lord bless you and keep you.
The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Go in peace.